Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. A trial against three correction officers on charges that they viciously beat a prisoner at the Attica Correctional Facility in August 2011 was supposed to start last Monday. Instead, they pled guilty to a misdemeanor charge of official misconduct and resigned from their jobs. Tom Robbins, an investigative reporter and passionate revealer of corruption and injustice, described in excruciating detail the crimes they were accused of in a feature story for the Marshall Project that appeared on the front page of the New York Times. And he's my guest today. It was almost horrible to read. It was like a horror story. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know if it was just me or... It was the grimmest story I've ever worked on, both the story of the beating of this man, George Williams, as well as the other stories that were told to me by inmates who are still there and whose names I ultimately decided not to use in the story because the threat of retaliation is so real. Yeah, they were so, they were so, it was so shocking. It, let's just talk for a minute about the Marshall Project. Okay. It's a, a nonprofit that was formed with the explicit purpose of bringing to everybody's attention what goes on in the criminal justice system. Is that a fair way of saying it? I think that's it. Yeah. And so you started, they asked you to do this? Bill Keller, who's the uh, chief uh, investigator in charge of everything at the, at the Marshall Project, uh, who I did not know, called me up and asked me if I'd be interested in taking a look at Attica because of the fact that the Correctional Association, New York's mm -hmm. nonprofit that has the right to inspect state prisons has been calling for Attica to be shut down. And he wanted to know whether or not that was be. the story. Yeah. And then he was able to arrange it with the Times. Was it? Well, that, that came somewhat later. I mean, at first I did my digging and, and I went up there a couple of times to see what was going on. You know, I, I was never given permission to tour the facility, you know, which really surprised me because the former state commissioner, Brian Fisher, uh, had offered to walk me through it as had another former superintendent of Attica. I said, yeah, sure, you need to see the place. But uh, in its wisdom, the Cuomo administration decided not to let me in. I, I did get into the visitor's room, and at one point I was allowed to attend a meeting of uh, inmates who were in an Alcoholics Anonymous class. But I did, never saw the entire prison, which is too bad. And you've been through a lot of prisons, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yeah, and know the system quite well, unfortunately. Well, I, I've seen a lot of prisons, but, you know, this one is, you know... Attica is seared in our minds. Were um, you a, a baby in 1970? No, I was older than that. I was 20-something years old. And that was the year of the riots. Yeah. And we remember in Rockefeller and all the, and the deaths. How many people were shot? 43. And you write that the bullet holes are still visible. Mm, well, you know, I, I believe oh, I that's know true. I that did not write that. Other, other people, people have it. asserted that. Yeah. I, I was told that by some inmates, but since I was never given the tour, I can't say it for sure. So there's, you think there's a whole history that you feel in the, in the workings of it, or that you've deduced that that's I, there? I, I think it's an inescapable conclusion that, as Brian Fisher said in a quote to me, there's an historical negativity to Attica that you can't get away from. And some of that is understandable. I mean, what happened there in that tiny little hamlet upstate New York to the people who worked there was horrific. I mean, there were over 40 hostages who were taken and uh, 11 of them never made it out alive. And they live in fear of that happening again. I mean, one of the things that corrections professionals who work there, you know, uh, told me over and over again, look, if the inmates ever decided they wanted to take over the place again, they could do it. And so then the question becomes, well, how do you run the prison? And at Attica, one of the observations that I was told by people who had visited that was different about Attica, Attica is a maximum security prison, which means that it gets people who are basically given the longest sentences and for the worst crimes, you know for the many, most part. How many maximums? There's 17 maximums in New York State. Uh, they've got a little less than half of all the prisoners at this point. But one of the observations that I was told is that at Attica, the guards walk through the halls with their batons in their hands with the uh, uh, web tightly wrapped around their hand. And I thought, hmm, well, what's that about? Is that different from any other place? And they said, yeah, they don't do that in other maximum facilities. They do that at Attica. And one of the things when I did get my one visit to this Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, uh, which was in the evening, and I was in the hall, and the current superintendent was walking me back there. All of a sudden, he said, get on the side. 
And here comes this troop of inmates who are being marched down on uh, getting their meds, as they call it. They're going to see a, a nurse who's going to give them their medications. And you sort of, you know, how you sort of look at people and you expect them to look at you and, and nod back and get some eye contact. And, and none of them were looking at me. None of them, you know, they just probably assumed I was another law enforcement official, you know, and that it wasn't wise to look at me. And there behind them were the guards with these, you know, clearly menacing clubs in their hands. And, and I think that that sends a message that, like, carries through, throughout the place, that uh, every inmate told me that they live in fear. Are they the guards second generation? Is some it a of them. family business? Well, it, ha it is in some cases. But I, it, being second generation doesn't necessarily, I mean, some of the most thoughtful, caring people that I met are second generation just guards. from the there. neighborhood. But there's not <laughs> as the many community. from the neighborhood at yeah. this point. You know, yeah. uh, they, pay, they come from further from around. From all over. I mean, one of the things, though, about Attica is that there's about 600 guards, and almost all, but I, as near as I could tell, they don't give me a racial count, but all but I think about eight of them oh. are white. And the prison population is. Uh, over 80 percent black and Latino. Yeah. It, we, the community in which a prison is situated plays an important role in the whole business of prisons. And so it always, it, when you talked about the people remember the riot, are they, that culture, it's very interesting because it's still in the surrounding area. Well, it's, it, those people who are old enough to remember it, and that goes to people who were just babies at yeah. the time, yeah. it's seared in their memory. And uh, they remember sitting in classrooms and listening to the prison siren go off and just not stopping. You know, they were used to hearing the siren because every now and again they used to have a farm back then and some prisoner would decide, oh, I'm going to take off and take a little vacation. And they'd put the siren on. But they said that would last a couple of minutes and it would turn off. The siren kept wailing throughout the morning and everybody knew that something terrible was going on. And so I heard that story over and over again from people. And we had the there. helicopters. Eventually yeah. there were helicopters yeah. coming in. Um, this, we've heard a lot about the city prisons. And, yes, Rikers. And Rikers especially. Uh, but the state seems to be a whole different system. Is it with the correction officers and the grievance procedures and the public view? Well, one of the differences is that in the city system, uh, the correction officers union... Uh, which also exerts a huge influence within that facility, just as they do in New York State Maximum. Um, when one of their members, one of an officer gets in trouble and they're charged uh, and brought before an arbitrator, we as the public get a chance to see what that allegation was and what the result was, because they do it through the city's arbitration process. In the state, all of that is secret. We're not allowed to see anything that happens, and that's under state law. And New York State is one of the only places, I'm told, that has such a provision. It's under the state civil rights law, Section 50A, and it prohibits us from seeing anything of the personnel records of a correction officer, as well as most police and fire departments at the same time. And one of the guys I wrote about was somebody who was to described to me by lots of former inmates initially and they referred to him first by his nickname, which was Preacher. <laughs> it didn't register the first time, but then when I heard it the sec from the second or third ex-inmate talking about this guy, Preacher, I finally said, well, who is this Preacher? And they said, well, he's a CO who uh, he likes to beat you, and he always says these Bible verses at the same time. And so I, I didn't have the name at that time, but I was able to research just Preacher and Attica through, there's a database of federal court records where sometimes inmates file federal civil rights lawsuits, and I found where inmates at Attic had sued someone named, Pr named Preacher, whose real name was Gary Pritchard, Jr. And he was kind of like the poster child for what was wrong with the place, because he'd been sued two dozen times. He'd been a guard for 25 years, and they had twice tried to fire him at two different prisons, but arbitrators had reduced the termination order to one-month suspensions or a $1,500 fine. And I had been told by former superintendents there that they had tried to take him out of what they call population when you're dealing with other inmates. And they were unable to do that, too, because under the contract, guards get to pick their posts according to seniority. And he didn't want to come out of population. So that's part of the conundrum and part of what festers behind those walls. Let's just go back to the case you wrote about, because that was so unusual that it got out of the system. Yeah. right? And that's because it was the first time, is it really, that that the guards have been indicted 
in the regular yeah, court let me, system? Yeah, let me clarify it to make it absolutely mm -hmm. clear. that It is the first time in state history that guards have been charged criminally for a non-sexual assault of an inmate. And there have been a number of cases where there have been, you know, any, con any physical contact with uh, sexual contact with an inmate is considered rape under the law now. So there have been quite a few instances in which there have been liaisons, or, uh, voluntarily or otherwise, between guards and inmates, and they've been charged criminally. But I, I was astonished, too, the when I heard that. Wait a minute, this can't be the first time. But nobody could come up with another example. The State Corrections Department acknowledges the first ones to our knowledge. The union says the first one to our knowledge. And yeah, so this one was kind of historic. And yet, uh, the district attorney says that the goal was never to put them in prison. It was to get them out of the system. Yeah, I was interested to hear him say that. Yeah, that was a funny statement, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it certainly was, given the fact that he had charged them with gang assault. And gang assault carries uh, up to 25 years in prison. It's a very serious crime. And the other felonies that they were charged with, each one of those would have carried a prison sentence. So if you were never looking to put them in prison, you sort of wonder, well, you know, yeah. and this is a question I, I haven't gone back to him. I think that he's a thoughtful man, this uh, Donald O'Gene, the mm -hmm. DA, but I want to press him on that. It's a good question. And do you think your article really helped to make them accept the plea deal? I don't which know. they weren't going to. I don't know. Look, you're too they, modest. I know. Well, look, can't it, say it came that. out. They, they did tell me that they decided Sunday night that they started negotiating over the weekend. This, the story went up live sometime Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is that there had been this same deal on the table, meaning it was available mm -hmm. to the defendants to take. They were told two years ago that we will give you this same deal, which was plead guilty to an official misconduct misdemeanor and we'll give you an ACD, adjournment mm -hmm. in contemplation of dismissal, which means there's no jail time. It just means that you'd be good for the next year and everything's okay. That's, that's the same criminal penalty I got when I jumped a turnstile in like 1975. <laughs> they got the other civil penalty, they would have to quit their jobs. And because of the fact that their jobs meant a lot to them, and particularly in a neighborhood where like jobs like that are few and far between, they come with pay and benefits, they decided not to do it. But the unusual part was that Usually DAs say that as kind of like bait to get rid of the case, get a conviction, and then they say, well, okay, you're out of luck. You waited too long, now we're going to trial. But in this case, over two years after it had been first represented and they had told them it's no longer on the table, it surfaced again and they gave them the deal. And the union was had its hands over the whole thing because their lawyers were union lawyers, right? Well, they weren't union lawyers, no. Or retained no. by the union. No, no, they weren't. No, they were not retained. Oh. The union doesn't do that. But oh. there's no question that the union helped them raise the money to pay for who, the, the three lawyers that they had were terrific. I mean, if you were going to get mm -hmm. arrested in Western New York, you, you, want, them, you want one of these guys to represent you. I see. Not guys, one of them was a woman. I'm sorry, Cheryl Booth. <laughs> now, how do we, um, how do we have such a system that they don't come out under public review. I mean, it all comes from the legislature because you say these are all sections of a law. Yes. So explain. Upstate what? I, I don't think that there's ever been a focus on this for whatever reason. No one has ever queried. If you look at the history of this section of the law, uh, Section 50A, it's been amended several times always to expand the number of people who are covered by it. So now I think the term of art is peace officers which I think may include EMTs as well in some I think And there's fire departments, police departments, uh, correction officers. Uh, I mean, the logic behind it is that somebody doing public work is entitled to the same privacy that you and I would have with a, if we worked for a private employer to our personnel file. The problem is, is that it's public money and they're doing a public job. And so if they're misbehaving and there's no transparency, the public never knows. Yeah. There used to be something with the New York City Police Department, wasn't it, that it was two days or something before you could question them? Or well, that's another question, is in terms of talking to an outside police agency. Yeah, there are some of the same rules in New York City's Police Department. In, in the case of the Correction Officers Union for the state prisons, it's even more expansive because it says that you don't have to talk to an outside police agency who comes to talk to you about a criminal investigation at all, even if the criminal investigation has to do with your job, which these did. So that when they went to question the COs, the correction mm -hmm. officers, 11 out of the 15 they went to question just said, I'm not talking to you. I don't have to talk to you. I'm not going to talk to you, which is an extraordinary thing, I think. So 
Is it Jim Aubrey who's chair of a, the criminal justice? Jeff Aubrey is the former Jeff. chair of yeah. the, of the uh, State yeah. Assembly Corrections Committee. It's now chaired by Daniel O'Donnell, your neighbor. And Daniel Donnell, I know, had right. went, to, went to Attica recently, took his own look. You know, I talked to him in preparation for this article. He's, I think he's very tuned in to these problems, and he's looking for legislative remedies. But I, I think that's the next step here is to take a look at when, when the, after yesterday's guilty verdict was announced, the current state acting corrections commissioner, a guy named Anthony Annucci, who's the former general counsel and a very thoughtful, good administrator, I think, issued a statement in which he said he was going to seek major changes in the contract that governs this part of correction officers' jobs when it comes up for renewal next year. Now, no one's ever said that before. So that, I took that Pretty to encouraging. be... encouraging. Yeah, I took that to be a significant yeah. comment by him. The training of, of correction officers, I mean, in New York City, it differs so much from police officers or any other uniformed services, inadequately, basically, they say, right? Well, training. I don't Under, think it, it can't cover everything, but they do go to, they do go to a training facility and they and they do work their way up these through are various state correction, state, state yeah. correction officials. They do they do get trained, but you know some of the rules are fairly loose. Like one of the things I was curious about was this business of the batons. Like yeah. I, I asked, like, well, isn't there a rule that says as to you know what you're supposed to do with your baton? And they said, no, we leave it up to the individual officers as to how they're going to deal with that. And in some facilities, they don't even carry their batons. You know, the other difference that the current commissioner, Anthony Annucci, mentioned yesterday is, is the cameras. And the, the DA in Wyoming County brought this up as well. Attica's one of the few facilities that does not have cameras in its corridors. And almost every inmate talked to me about this. And they said that they believed that the reason that there weren't cameras was because the guards don't want them. And when I pressed Annucci, the commissioner on it, he finally said, well, I'm going to launch a project and I'm going to get those cameras installed. And that's, that's significant, too. And the, the charge that the a gang assault, the, the correction officers from your articles and some of the others I've read, they are gangs in a way, aren't they? They have their own teams. Is that right? Did I, I mean, the black gloves, what, where did I see this? Yes, that was, in, that was in the story, yeah. the, the, black, the yeah. black gloves yeah. squad. Uh, they back up each other? Look, some of the... In, Inmates who I found to be otherwise credible, you know, and they exaggerate like all of us, but inmates, <laughs> I heard it from enough inmates over and over again who described the guards, forget about the black glove squad, which stemmed from these puncture resistant gloves that they got and, and it became a name and, and administrators told me that's a myth. But there's yeah. no question uh, but that the, the perception is that they're the biggest gang of all that they back each other up. I mean, one of the, some of the most disturbing stories I heard were about correction officers who had tried to intervene in situations favorably, where they thought that inmates were unjustly being mm -hmm. punished and being called inmate lovers by other guards. And I think that that's part of what infects the workforce in any big, tough mm -hmm. institution like Attica, where everyone's got to know I've got your back. Everyone wants to know, in case mm -hmm. of trouble, I've got your back. So if you don't back me up now, I'm not going to back you up later. So that becomes it's, something it's, that disables, I think, the yeah. best intentions. I mean, we don't, I don't mean to, and I don't, you certainly didn't give the impression that all correction officers are bad. <laughs> and I hope not. You didn't. And uh, we should all, I think, remember that. So as an investigative reporter, how long did you work on this story? I, I started last spring. It, it, it took about nine months. There was some lag time in there, uh, but I made... Uh, uh, three trips up to Attica, another trip to Warsaw, where the court case was being handled, uh, which is a town about 15 miles away. Uh, and I met repeatedly with inmates in the visiting room, uh, just talking to them about their lives. Uh, it's a very intensive uh, location. It's hard. There's no privacy on it. And uh, one of the things I realized right away was that the inmates were dubious about whether or not they should talk to okay. me, which I understood. And since then, though, you know, I, I've been in touch with a lot of them. Are you hearing from them? Yes. I, I haven't heard from them since the story came no, out. I, because I, I did wait. hear from you the... You will get the letters. Yeah, no, I did hear from the spouse of yeah, somebody yeah. who's incarcerated who said that people were talking about yeah. it, which I'm sure they are. Um, how did you become an investigative reporter? <laughs> Beats working. <laughs> were you uh, so curious when you were young? No, I, I was working uh, as a 
community organizer in the Lower East Side doing real work in, in the 70s and uh, uh, when the height of building abandonment. And I started writing about what I saw. And a friend of mine who did work for a newspaper said, you know, you can get paid to do that. And so one thing led to another. I eventually got some jobs writing and worked as the editor for City Limits magazine for a long time, which has a great series that mm -hmm. I worked on for CUNY coming out this week on people who have mistakes on their criminal records. Uh -huh. Uh, and I've been doing it ever since. And you've learned, you, I mean, so by talking to people and everything, you learn where the sources are and how to get them. And the, I mean, it's like being a detective also, isn't it? Yes, except yeah. they usually get subpoena power. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're also um, teaching what it is to be an investigative reporter at the journalism school at City University. Yes, CUNY's journalism yeah. school, right, terrific So place. do you find that, what's the difference now with the Internet? Well, you know, I, I'm very disappointed that none of my students buy a newspaper. That's one of the things. Terrible, they they come it? with everything. I, <laughs> I ask them how they find stories, and many of them tell me they decide to read by what they see on uh, Twitter or Facebook, and I try to instill with them that that's the wrong way to go about looking, that you have to look yourself, even if, it, if you're not going to buy a newspaper, at least skin through it, see if there's anything else that captures your attention. But, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, there is so much digital, digitized information that's so readily available now, people tend to think that they can do stories from their desk. And I maintain that the best tool in investigative reporting is the telephone, which is almost as good as talking to somebody in person. And you, but you couldn't have written a story without having seen some of the prisoners in Attica, whether it was just in the visiting room or... I would not have written it. Yeah. Put it that way. Yeah. Right. I mean, I did a lot of research that involved computer work and reading records and sorting through court cases. Uh, I made several trips to Albany, both to see the commissioner who I interviewed at some length and uh, to uh, go through some court files up there. So do you then become an advocate for different things after you've investigated? Yeah, I care about this. Stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know if you call it an advocate, but, I, you know, there's no question but that you end up with, like, I'm... I'm I'm outraged by what I've seen in this story. And I think it's a crime that, I mean, one of the things that one of the inmates said, you know, and he wasn't a wild man, he was a very thoughtful guy, he was doing a long sentence. He looked at me with, he really wanted to know why is it that people in your profession care so much about what goes on in Guantanamo and are not interested in what happens right here in New York? And I was like, that's a really good question and I can't answer it. Why do people not care that much? I mean, it's about prisons, they don't. There is a lack of empathy, it seems to me, in the public. I think that we have a tendency to sort out our compassion in folks who have been labeled as having broken the law. It's much harder for them to work back into that scope of compassion. Do you ever feel when you go into a facility like this that there but for the grace of God goes you? Well, look, there's certainly stuff I did that, you know, if yeah. uh, I had gone a little bit further down the road, I could have been there. And I, I met people who are very much like me. Mm -hmm. You have I, too. I, I don't, I never did anything that bad that I think I would have been in jail. But every time I went into Bedford Hills, I always thought, it's just so easy. It's a the flip. women's facility. Over yeah. in a minute, you could do something and you land up here. One of the things that my friend Judy Clark, who you know, mm -hmm. who is still doing this terrible sentence of 75 to life, tells me is that most people at Bedford Hills Women's Prison, where she's incarcerated, the mistakes that put them in prison were about five seconds long. Mm -hmm. And most That's of us it. have like some five seconds where we did something right. that we thought was really dumb. And then it's everlasting right. without any sense of forgiveness or enough or understand I, I just don't understand all right so what should we do now i mean why did they close we're under the prison costs us a lot of money criminal corrections yes. it costs a Constantly lot of money costly. close some facilities always limited as to how many facilities because of the power of the of the correction officers and the economic importance in the communities in which they are right mm. but we close some facilities why do we have 2200 is that if that's the number still in attica if it's a maximum secured facility, shouldn't maximum secured facilities be smaller? You know, Attica was, had about the same number of prisoners at the time of the 1971 riot. And if you read the McKay Commission report, which studied the riot, one of the points they made was they thought that there were at least 1,000 too many prisoners there, that, there's, that the proper number was about 1,600, and that that would be. And yet, because of the fact that New York, even though it expanded enormously, its prison facilities during the 1980s, um, it never had enough space in its maximum security. So they just ended up piling them up. There's still over 80 
cells that are double bunked at Attica, meaning there's two inmates in a cell designed for one. And, and that's, that's something that can lead to trouble and does lead regularly to trouble. Look, there's a bunch of different ideas floating around, and I think that's the kind of public discussion that I hope that my story would help spark, which is that, look, if these places are truly infected with this kind of culture of violence and fear, what are the resolutions? And one way that the Correctional Association, the group that I mentioned earlier, talks about is like taking older prisoners and moving them down to medium security facilities. Or letting them out. Or letting them <laughs> out because they, they're, they're, the backup in parole is astonishing in terms of the people who are serving time who have been there for over 20 years. We keep people. That's a whole other system. Are you going to yes. write about that? Well, I think there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of, there's a lot to look at there. But yeah. I mean, you know, you asked about like, how do we get rid of places like Attica? And I, you know, I, I met people who say that there are ways to what they call repurpose these prisons, you know, make them into, I mean, mental health is a huge issue in these maximum security prisons. A lot of prisoners are ailing from mental problems. And one of the ways that you could do is perhaps turn it into some kind of mental health institution, even though we deinstitutionalized those years ago because they didn't work. You know, are we smart enough now to be able to reimagine that and like take a place like Attica and turn it into a place that's creative and actually helps people? Might not be impossible. And you're encouraged by some of the people that you met in the administration of criminal justice in the state, that some of them are really... Yes. Yeah, it's just, yeah. I, I, I do. I mean, almost everybody I met who was a professional who'd worked there, you know, was someone who I was convinced was trying to figure out ways to make the system work in a, in a meaningful, human, compassionate way. The problem is there's just a disconnect. Um, the phrase that was used to me by people who spent a lot of time at Attica as volunteers was that it's a guard-run prison, meaning despite the best intentions of the administrators, the guards still decide what goes on at the end of the day. Some volunteers who've been going to Attica for years told me that they will arrive at night to teach a class or to like have a mentoring visit or, and they're told, sorry, your paperwork's not here. And if they say to the guard, yeah, but you've been seeing me every week or every month for the last six years, your paperwork's not here. So they turn around and they have to drive home to Buffalo or Rochester, wherever they were. There's that kind of thing that, you know, sends a message to people about what goes on behind so those bars. So we have to watch these contract negotiations and what yeah. it comes down to. Are you going to follow up with us with the Marshall Project? Yes. The Marshall but, Project will certainly be following up, and, and I'm, I'm sure I'll be part of it on some and level. And people can read your article, unless if they haven't read it, on the Marshall Project website. Yes, and, and, and you can read the full article because the Times used explosive deleted to describe <laughs> what sparked the George Williams incident. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I uh, just am astonished at your work and look forward to more of it. Thank you so much for having Thanks, me, Brian. Thanks, Tom really Robbins. It. Great to see you. Thank you. you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.